I currently do all my own audio and video editing, and I've been using a 2017 MacBook Pro for this for some time, and frankly, it's slow and it needs updating. So I picked up a Mac Mini M4 because they really provide great value. However, as soon as you start upgrading the disk and memory on those Macs, the value proposition changes quickly as things like disk and memory upgrade prices are, quite frankly, ridiculous. Sadly, memory you can't do much about as the memory is on the M4 CPU die, so there are no later upgrade options, but the price Apple charges for SSD storage is way over the top, and here you have options. Firstly, it's now possible to get aftermarket upgrades that you can put in the Mac Mini. However, this still limits you to the max possible two terabytes available from Apple, and it requires some disassembly, which isn't for everyone. The other option is to use external storage with a Thunderbolt 4 NVMe enclosure, which allows you to get to eight terabytes for about the same price as Apple charges for just two. So this is gonna be a two part video where I look at implementing this Mac with external high speed storage. And in this video, I'm gonna look at and test the external storage options to see how they perform and how this approach compares cost wise to an internal upgrade from Apple directly. I will test two Thunderbolt 4 enclosures, one from Zite and one from Ugreen. And I'll be testing these with three different four terabyte NVMe drives for performance and thermals. And this includes the Samsung 990 Pro, the Lexar NM790 and the Western Digital SN850X. And we're gonna see how performance differs across the SSDs and how it's impacted by thermal management on these enclosures. So in the second video, I'm gonna look at how to use the solution I settle on for all the major needs on a Mac, such as application installs and home drive and data usage, so I can get away with buying just the basic onboard disk and we'll see what savings it produces and what this does to disk performance compared to the integrated disk. This video will be useful for anyone also who just wants to compare the performance of these enclosures and even more importantly, the SSDs themselves. So let's get started. Let's start by looking at the two enclosures that I'm gonna be testing. First, we have the Ugreen 40 gigabits per second hard drive enclosure, and this provides a Thunderbolt 4 connection, which notionally provides up to that 40 gigabits per second. However, in reality, around eight gigabits per second is reserved for video, so the theoretical max for TV4 is nearer 32 gigabits per second which is around 4,000 megabytes per second. The unit is all aluminium and it's definitely a high quality construction. The SSD is held under a thick aluminium cover and it comes with a heat pad to dissipate heat from the SSD into the case. This unit is also fan cooled where air is drawn in from one end of the unit and then pushed out the other. And I'm gonna talk more about this later. The unit is also pretty compact and it supports a range of NVMe SSDs from the smaller 2230 size up to the more standard 2280 size that I'm gonna be testing here today. The SSD itself is held in with a metal screw that finishes off in a generally well-made feel. Personally, I'm generally impressed with the build quality of Ugreen's products. This device uses an AS Media 2464 PD chipset as the Thunderbolt 4 to PCI bridge, which provides, in principle, solid throughput. It also comes wrapped in a silicon case which could come in handy because, spoiler here, these enclosures get pretty hot. Secondly, we're gonna look at the Zyke Drive's Z666 USB 4 enclosure, and this is a larger form factor and it has a greater heat dissipation surface area. You can slide a very short cable inside for carrying around, and a 50 centimeter cable is also provided, but the one that fits inside the unit is really short at just around 10 centimeters. Inside the device, it's a similar story with support for the same range of NVMe form factors, and a thermal had to transfer heat to the aluminium case for passive cooling, as this unit has no fan. The NVMe is not held in with a screw, but rather with a rubber grommet, but this seems to behave fine. So the unit is bigger, but as we're gonna to come to, it's also silent. Uh, but can it keep the SSD cool enough to prevent throttling? And this unit again uses the same AS Media chipset, so we should likely expect similar peak performance. However, peak performance isn't all that matters. Different SSDs have different performance characteristics based on the type of cache they use and how much there is of it. There is also always the question of thermal management as SSDs can get really hot and they typically throttle once a threshold is met, which then can significantly hinder their IO performance. And here on this drive, instead of a silicon case, it comes with a hard plastic case, though this does look like it's gonna reduce the ability of the device to shed heat as effectively. And we're gonna test on that a bit later. So both of these products are available on Amazon or direct, and I'm sure from other retailers. I'm gonna post some affiliate links below, along with those of the SSDs that I'm gonna test. And on Amazon at least, there's offers regularly on these units. So for the SSDs, I picked three of my most liked four terabyte SSDs to test. The Samsung 990 Pro, the Lexar NM790, and the Western Digital SN850X. 
These drives are actually all quite different in the way they implement their caching, and they also come with different levels of heat generation, which we're going to see during the testing. Testing itself was performed on a 2024 Mac Mini M4 with that Thunderbolt 4 interface. And the test suite basically is to copy four gigabyte file around a thousand times in rapid succession to fill the disk and then immediately read them off again sequentially and then delete them. Each set of write, read and delete tests is performed at least five times and I provide a 15 minute cool down period between the tests and then I use averages from across all the test suites. It's worth noting that all these tests were actually very consistent on their performance. But as we're going to see, some tests saw degraded performance due to rising temps across the test suite, even with that 15 minute cooldown. But all the tests on these drives and enclosures were identical and they were performed in the same conditions. So these tests put both the NVMe drive and the enclosure through high thermal stress, but it also exposes how the drive's caching is performed and the size of the SLC cache in particular, as the test will exhaust this cache quickly and then it's going to force the drive to write to TLC NAND. All these drives use TLC and not QLC NAND. And the test also demonstrates how effectively each enclosure is able to dissipate heat over time. All the tested drives are quoted of having around 6500 to 6900 megabytes per second write performance and in the 7300 to 7500 megabytes range for read performance. But this is peak. So even though these drives may seem over spec for a maximum 4000 megabytes per second Thunderbolt 4 interface, Actually, you'll likely see them drop significantly below this if writes do not go to the SLC cache. Also, it's worth adding here that these workload is not likely representative of a typical real world workload, but rather this is a real torture test to identify how each enclosure and drive combination performs under stressful conditions. And we're gonna come back to what though in the findings at the end of the video. But in most cases, you could expect not to experience the same level of heat during normal use, Unless, of course, your use case is heavy write performance of workloads on large files. And if your write activity is more intermittent, which it most likely is, you could be going to expect to be writing to SLC cache in most cases. So now let's get to the actual testing. So first of all, testing with the Samsung 990 Pro 4 terabyte NVMe. And for these tests, I removed both units from their cases and actually placed them both on the silicon case of the Ugreen device. And this means that both units had almost maximum surface area to dissipate heat. All tests, the ambient here was around 27 degrees centigrade, which is around 80 Fahrenheit. I also placed a Zyke drive on its side, so the majority of surface area could dissipate heat away optimally. And if we look now at the performance chart, we can see that both drives achieved around 3,300 megabytes per second for around 12% of the drive size, which is around 440 gigabytes. Although I don't think this is perfect as the drive will also be writing the back end to TLC NAND and freeing up cache as it goes. But this is consistent to the 442 gigabytes stated on Tech Power Up's SSD database. The drive also does have a DRAM cache of a stated four gigabytes. But after that 440 gigabytes, performance drops sharply as the drive is forced to write directly to TLC NAND at a rate of about 1,500 megabytes per second. And by about 50% capacity, there's a slight divergence with the Zyke performing marginally better. Tech Power Up does say the majority of the cache is dynamic, but there's no evidence of folding here. And this is the process where the drive has to reconfigure SSU cache into TLC storage. And this can cause choppy performance. But indeed, both these drives seem to provide 1,500 to 2,000 megabytes per second, all the way to 99% capacity. Read performance is also very similar with the Zyke having a marginal edge with a very consistent read speed of 3,450 megabytes per second. Looking at firmware performance during the write test, we can see that temps steady on both at about 65 degrees centigrade while they're writing to the SLC cache. But once the writes to TLC start, temps rise to on both, stabilizing at around 81 degrees C. Both drives seem to manage the drive fine at this temperature and there's no evidence of throttling on either enclosure. So next we look at the performance of the Lexar NM790 4TB, which is also a TLC NVMe. The two enclosures perform in a similar pattern, but there are some clear variances, and the results here are an average of five tests each, so it doesn't look like the difference between the two is just caused by test variability. The SSD database suggests that this drive only has 273 gigabytes of dynamic SSD cache, along with a 40 megabytes host memory buffer. However, the drive actually maintains 3100 megabytes per second in both enclosures for about 16% of the disk size, or that's around 600 gigabytes written. It then drops to 2,500 megabytes per second until 40% of the capacity, 
and then the performance slightly differently up to 75%. And then we see what looks like this folding process where the drives are reconfiguring SLC into TLC to maximize capacity. This cache looks to be dynamic and this process causes write performance from between 2500 to 1000 megabytes per second for the last terabyte of the disk. And this is one of the reasons that many NVMEs perform better when the disk is less full. As the SLC cache is converted, the performance on the drive is going to drop. Read performance is interesting again and the test on the Zeich enclosure is slightly lower and more variable. And this seems to be thermal related as it looks like the NM790 may throttle somewhere close to 68 degrees C. And as we're going to see in the next chart, where we see that the Lexar drive runs cooler, but the U Green maintains a consistent 70 degrees C and the Zyke 5 degrees hotter at 75 degrees C. So maybe the Zyke is entering thermal throttling territory and the U Green less so. That small fan, the U Green, may be tipping the balance here. Now, note that the SSD database may or may not be accurate, but it believes the Lexar chip is a 12 nanometer process die compared to 8 nanometers on the Samsung but it runs fewer, faster memory channels. So this may explain why its thermals perform differently to the previous SSD. Okay, so next on to the WD Black SN850X, and this is a TLC NAND SSD also, but the database proclaims it as having 600 gigabytes of SLC cache. However, it also has two gigs of DRAM cache. And again, the database says it uses a 16 nanometer process for the dies, and that's NAND from Keoxia. So it's probably gonna run a bit hotter. And in the performance chart, we see that Ugreen seems to manage the firmware fine with a more consistent performance. The drive runs at 3350 megabytes per second for around 30% of the drive capacity, which is about 650 megabytes. So marginally the best performance in terms of speed, but it also has the largest SLC cache. After this time, both enclosures see a drop in performance, but the Ugreen maintains 1650 megabytes per second and the Zyke fades away at about 60% capacity and settles at around 1000 megabytes per second. Despite here are how the drive deals with its cache, but these recovery spikes are also lower on the Zyke enclosures. And now looking at the thermal graph, we can see here that the drive in both enclosures gets a lot hotter than both the Lexar or the Samsung devices, and it eventually reaches 90 degrees centigrade on both. The climb in the U-Green is slower, but once it gets to 90 degrees C, the U-Green does seem to do a better job at keeping the drive from throttling. It's worth noting that the enclosures also get really hot with this drive. Typically the enclosures peaked at probably around 20 degrees C lower than the reported temps on the dies. And in the case of the H50X, the case hit 70 degrees C's on the outside on both the Zyke and the U-Green, and they were both really hot to the touch. And with the Zyke, we see that the residual heat from the write test also impacts the following read test, where read performance starts out at around 2,550 megabytes per second, and then it does slowly recover back to above 3,000 megabytes per second as the drive cools down. And this is because the read test is far less stressful for heat generation. The performance is also notably choppier on that read test. The Ugreen, meanwhile, shows no slowdown on the read test maintaining a consistent 3450 megabytes per second across the entire four terabyte transfer test. And just to confirm that it's the thermals that are impacting the Zyke, let's run the same set of tests with the hard protective cover on the Zyke drive. And this certainly makes it easier to handle, but it reduces the effectiveness of the aluminum chassis to shed that heat into the air. And we see a reduction in performance when we're cased installed with the lowest of around 970 megabytes with write performance without the case and dropping to about 850 megabytes with it fitted. Read performance is also impacted more, dropping to 2425 megabytes per second compared to the 2550 megabytes without the case and before recovering as the drive cools and that also happens more slowly. So the WD Black provides the best performance of the drives at the time recording, it's around 280 US dollars, which places it between the 327 USD for the Samsung and 260 for the Lexar, but it causes by far the highest temps on both enclosures, and it seems to trigger throttling on the Zyke, at least in the rather extreme test scenario that I'm running here. And finally, we look at the time each test took to complete, where the smaller bars show better performance, and we see a clearer overall picture of the relative performance, which given they use the same chipset and appear to have around the same maximum throughput, comes down more to the thermal management for each drive. The right test times here show the time to aggressively fill the disk to completion. And we see that the Zyke shown in red has a small advantage with the Samsung 990 Pro. It's close, but a little slower than the Ugreen shown in green when the Lexar NM790 is used, but with the heat generation of the WD Black drive, 
the passively cooled Zeik appears to get left behind with the active cooling of the Ugreen getting a 25% advantage. And for read performance, which causes less heat stress, it's closer, though the Zeik is still a little behind on the Lexan and the WD Black drives, and this appears to be caused primarily by residual heat from the right test, which had not yet dissipated. The Zyke also has a slight advantage of really less than 1% when it comes to the Samsung 990 Pro. So I'm going to give my conclusions, and they actually may not be what you think they're going to be. But before that, please do like this if it's useful or informative. I've been doing a lot of content on hard disk performance and reliability as well as NAS and other storage topics, and I have more coming there, but I'll also be doing more content on SSD performance testing, and I have a pile of disks here to run tests on. So if this might be interesting, please do sub to help get those updates, but also to help me out with the algorithm and growing my small channel. It's really appreciated more than you realize. And please do comment below with your thoughts and experiences with these or other external storage options. So conclusions. So it may seem that the Ugreen is the better choice due to its handling of the thermals, but it isn't so straightforward. First of all, the Zyke is passively cooled, and that little fan the Ugreen is actually pretty noisy. And given how SSDs run, that fan runs most of the time to some degree. There is also a point of failure there with the Zyke having no moving parts. I don't think the Ugreen thermal performance would be as good if that fan did happen to fail. Now that said, the Ugreen does seem to do a more solid job on the thermals in a smaller form factor, and it also looks really nice. However, despite the performance of the SN850X, I just don't think that SSD is a good choice for an external enclosure due to that heat generation. It seems it needs really solid cooling and airflow. So I think in a good motherboard slot with a big heat sink, it's gonna do a great job. Even in the Ugreen with the fan going, the enclosure was 70 degrees and almost impossible to handle. So for this use case, I would actually opt for the Samsung, though it's currently the most expensive of the three. It's still an insanely better value proposition than the $800 Apple want to charge for an upgrade from 256 gigabytes up to two terabytes on their SSD. And even with the price of the enclosure, it's still around half the price for twice the capacity you get from Apple. And of course you have the option of upgrades later and you can go beyond that two terabyte limitation in the Mac mini. And if you're gonna go for the Samsung 990 Pro, then both these enclosures seem to manage their thermals just fine. And at this point, the result's pretty close, so it probably just comes down to which you prefer and what price you can pick them up for. And I'll drop those links below so you can go and compare the current prices on all of this hardware. Personally, though I like the build and the aesthetics on the Ugreen, I'm gonna use the Zyke Drive unit. And this is because this machine will be used for audio recording and the fan on that Ugrain is audible enough that it could cause me a problem with noise pollution on my recordings. And of course, these additional moving parts that could fail. And I would pair it with the Samsung 990 Pro for the reasons I mentioned. And in this configuration, the Zyke performs well, if not even slightly better than the Ugrain. Also, the Zyke suffers really only in high stress conditions for the drive, which you're not likely to hit during regular use. So. In most cases, the performance will be, I would say, very similar, and the fan noise really becomes more of a deciding factor. So in the next video, I'm gonna be looking at setting this up on the Mac Mini to use this external drive and to minimize use of that internal disk, because if you're video editing, then high capacity and performance storage really is important. And then we're gonna look deeper into how we, what we saw today compares for the onboard options also. And with that, I will see you in the next.